I'm Reverend Colleen Tanaka, and I welcome you to Healing Conversations for Our Time, a monthly series that we're going to present the first Wednesday of every month. Tonight, we're going to be talking about waking up to white privilege. These conversations came to be after the death of George Floyd, when practitioner Sheila Callum, Clay T. White, and I got together and sat together in the silence and vision for what is ours to do at this time? How are we called to serve? And what evolved and what was revealed were healing conversations, an opportunity for us to come together and talk about very relevant conversations for our time and to share from a place of open hearts and listen with an open heart to one another in order to experience healing, evolution, awakening, and ultimately change. So we thank you for joining us tonight. We honor your presence here and your willingness to join the healing conversation. So the title of my talk is Waking Up to White Privilege. And that title came to me because I was reflecting on my own journey of waking up to white privilege, which of course is always an ongoing journey. And I think really is the opportunity for all of us to wake up to white privilege. And so what is white privilege? It's a system that I was born into that automatically gave me powers and privileges, inherent advantages that I am not aware of. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about that analogy that we hear sometimes about that fish don't know they're in water because they're so surrounded by it, it's impossible for them to see. And I think those of us who are white living in a majority white society with systems in place that have been created by the white majority, we are not really aware of the inherent privilege that we have by being light-skinned. And I first started waking up to this about 30 years ago when I met my husband, Lester, who is Japanese-American. And we met and were married within three months and just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. We have two children, Luke and Dana, who of course are biracial. And so as a white woman growing up, I was not aware of things that I started to become aware of when I met Lester. For example, we could be out somewhere and someone could say to Lester, wow, you speak really good English. And he would respond, well, oh, so do you. Now, no one would ever be saying to me, you speak good English. So I thought that was kind of unusual. And then my own children, people would ask them a lot when they were younger and in school, what are you? Now, I can assure you, no one's ever asked me, what are you? But my children used to get asked that often. The other experience that I had was joining my husband's family and being the only white person in the family. And so in our smaller family groups and larger family gatherings, and then larger community gatherings in Hawaii, I found myself often the only, if not one of very few, white people in the group. And it dawned on me how seldom I ever had that experience in my life, that I was the minority in a room, or perhaps the only one of my race in a room. And so while I didn't have a name for it then, I started waking up to these differences and things people said to my husband and my children that they would never say to me or they wouldn't say if I had a partner who was white and had children who were white. So that was my first awakening. Although I didn't have a name for it, I just realized, wow, there's a difference. People say some silly stuff to people. So 
Then in 2013, when I started ministerial school, we went to the very first retreat. It was the opening event of our whole ministerial educational career. And at that retreat, a group of students from the Santa Rosa campus presented a play on racism and white privilege. And that is not a term that I'd ever heard before. And we were given a handout, which I have right here. I've had all these years, I pulled it out of my binder. And it is a list of 50 things that are the daily effects of white privilege. Now this was written back in 1988 by a woman by the name of Peggy McIntosh. And she says here, I decided to try to work on myself by identifying some of the daily effects of white privilege in my life. And there are a list of 50 things. And so after the play, Reverend Laura Howlett and I went back to our room and we read through every one of the things on this list. Here's a few of them. For example, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. I can turn on the television and see people of my race widely represented. My husband can't, my children can't, but I can. White privilege. I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own physical protection. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. These are just a few examples of the 50 things on this list. And there's a link to it below this talk. And if you go to our website, cslgld.org, and scroll down to Healing Conversations, there's a link there too, to a number of references that I'm gonna speak about tonight. So Reverend Laura and I were going through this list and noticed, I noticed that I started to feel defensive, saying, well, you know, I, I'm a good person. I don't do these things. There isn't anything I've done to get these things. That's not right. Anyway, all of these things that I commonly hear people say now, I was saying them too. I was totally saying them too. And there's a term for that that I've learned now, and that is white fragility. So that's the defensiveness that I feel when someone tells me I have white privilege and I'm, wait a minute, no, I don't. And sometimes we think that privilege means that I have a lot of money and I don't have any problems in my life. That's not what we're talking about here. White privilege is the fact that every time I open my mouth, I'm not speaking for an entire race. That I don't need to protect my children from systemic racism. Those are things I don't even have to think about. So one of the things about white privilege is that I am living unconsciously. I'm unconscious to all of these benefits I have that I don't even realize I have that I started waking up to in a biracial relationship. So these feelings of defensiveness that can come up that we can sometimes experience is referred to as white fragility. And I know that I experienced it myself. And one of the things that contributes to white fragility is the way that we define racism. So in her book, White Fragility, Robin DiAngelo says that we have a simplistic idea that racism is limited to individual acts of meanness, purposeful unkindness, purposefully causing harm. So that's how we define racism. And so then me, Colleen, I can say, well, I'm not that. I don't intentionally ever purposefully afflict harm on someone because of the color of their skin. I'm not that, I'm a good person. I'm not a racist. And so by me saying that to myself, I'm not a racist, I'm not that. So then there's no further work required, is there? Because I'm not that. And I can tell you honestly, that I can look out in the world and label people white supremacists and think those people are the white supremacists and I'm not that. And so in that place of comfort, I don't have to work on myself. I don't have to wake up because I've determined that that's not what I am. And yet I have been born into and socialized into racist systems. 
I have been born into and, and socialized into racist systems. And so if I do nothing to challenge those systems, in that way, I am a racist. If I do nothing to challenge these systems, then I am a racist. I have, and we all have, the opportunity to wake up to how I am complicit in a racist society. How am I complicit in a racist society? And I can interrupt that complicity. That's the opportunity, interrupting that complicity that I may have been ignorant to up until now. So where do I start? That's always the question. It's a question I have for myself, and I know it's a question I hear a lot of people asking. What do I do? Where do I start? So the first thing that I can do is start reflecting on my own whiteness, my own experience of being a white person in our society. What does it mean to be white? How has being white shaped my life? These are good questions. I don't think they're questions maybe until recently we've asked ourselves. So what does it mean to be white? If I can't understand what it means to be white, then how can I possibly understand what it means not to be white? If I don't even have any understanding of what it means to be white, how can I possibly understand what it means not to be white? So this process of awakening is an ongoing process. And so one of my next powerful experiences was in 2015, when I attended the Parliament of the World's Religions in Salt Lake City. Now that was a glorious experience. And they had several focuses of that parliament. And one of them was racial equity and economic equity. And Black Lives, Matters, Black Lives Matter was represented there. And again, Reverend Laurie Howlett and I attended this breakout session of Black Lives Matter. Now I can tell you, it was the biggest breakout session I've ever been to at any conference I've ever attended. This room at the Salt Lake City Convention Center was literally the size of an, of an airplane hangar. So Reverend Laura and I were sitting in there and black folks started standing up and just sharing their experiences, just sharing their experiences. So here's an example of what was shared. Someone stood up and was talking about the talk that they need to have with their children. And in my culture, for me, the talk is about the birds and the bees. But what this individual was talking about, the talk, is the conversations that black, brown, and indigenous people, our brothers and sisters, have to have with their children about how do you safely interact with the police so as not to be harmed. I've never had that conversation with my children. Well, maybe the only conversation we've ever had about it was the fact that we never had the conversation. That's white privilege. The fact that I don't have to have that conversation. The fact that I don't even know that people are having that conversation. At that time, I wasn't as aware. Another story someone shared was that they were driving home from work one day and they lived in an affluent neighborhood. Now, this is a black person sharing this story. And they were driving up to their house and they were listening to a song that they wanted to finish listening to. So they pulled up in front of the house, reclined their seat somewhat, and just relaxed for a moment to listen to this song before they pulled into their driveway. And it wasn't long before there was a knock on the car window and the police were there wanting to know what they were doing there in that neighborhood. Why are they stopped there? 
If I pulled up in front of my house and closed my eyes to finish listening to a song, I don't think the police are gonna come knocking on my window. And if they did, they weren't knocking to find out why I was there. They'd be knocking to see if I was okay. That's white privilege. And story after story after story was shared and I realized I don't have these experiences. I don't need to contend with these experiences. I'm not conscious of this stuff because I'm not aware of it. It's the privilege of being white. So rather than ask the question, if I have been shaped by racist systems, it's more powerful for us to reflect on how have I been shaped by these systems? How have I been shaped by them? What is my implicit bias? Things that I'm not even aware of. So the first thing that we do, and where do we start, is asking those questions I've mentioned previously and educating ourselves. We have the opportunity to learn how to be anti-racist. Not to even say I'm not a racist. How do I step up and be consciously anti-racist? And it's an ongoing education and practice. So when I've been reflecting on this, I've thought about my spiritual journey. And I thought about what it was like when I was completely asleep to the fact that I am a spiritual being. And I was moving through my life unconsciously, completely asleep to the fact that I am a divine being created in the image and likeness of God. And that there are universal principles that are operating in my life that I can live in harmony with, that result in living this beautiful life of completeness and wholeness and harmony and grace. And having been a teacher for many years, something that I hear from people is, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't wake up until I was 40, 50, 60, 70. And while people aren't beating themselves up for not waking up before then, they may feel a little bit of regret of having been asleep for so long. So when I think about waking up to white privilege, sometimes when we look at white fragility, we start, the fact that I've woken up, I can be defensive and start beating myself up that I didn't know. There's no use in that. I didn't beat myself up when I woke up to my spiritual being. What I decided was, oh my goodness, here I am, this divine spiritual being that I didn't even know I was, and I got busy educating myself. I read books, I took classes, I had conversations with people, and I started spiritual practice, all kinds of different spiritual practices. And so that's our opportunity here, is that it's a journey, not a destination. And, and I don't need to beat myself up for having been asleep up until now. It's just like, oh my goodness, now I'm awake. What is mine to do? and I can get busy educating myself, and I can become part of the solution. So I can start to explore very specific and personal ways that I have been complicit in white supremacy. Because white privilege upholds white supremacy. And so in this moment, at this time in history, it seems so obvious to me that the universe is knocking on our door. The universe is knocking on our door, inviting us to wake up. And so just like on our spiritual path, waking up to white privilege, we can start that journey with a clear intention. I have a clear intention. I purposefully open my heart. I soften my heart to myself and others, and I'm willing. I'm willing to take the journey, and I trust that I'm guided on the journey, because I am. Our global organization, Centers for Spiritual Living, has a mission, and that is, we envision a world that works for everyone and for all of creation. That's our global mission. 
Just sit with this for a minute. To create a world that works for everyone and for all of creation. What is my part in that? What is mine to do? Ernest Holmes says that unity is expressed in multiplicity. Unity is expressed in multiplicity. We can embrace and celebrate our differences while honoring the spiritual nature of one another. Because the fact is, that which I do to another, I do to myself. Because there's only one self, with a capital S. And that which I do to another, I do to myself. We truly are brothers and sisters. And Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. writes, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. We will remember the silence of our friends. So it's my commitment to continue waking up. It's an ongoing journey. I invite you to join me on that journey. And there's one last thing I want to share with you. The entire time that I was researching, meditating, contemplating, and sitting with this talk, I kept hearing one scripture over and over again in the silence. And when I looked it up, it was from John 9, 25. Whereas I was blind, now I see. The scripture is, one thing I do know. I was blind, and now I see. Namaste. Namaste.